Thank you for uh, watching this uh, basket starfish, our language core. Uh, again, um, uh, I my research has been going on for the last 20 something years. I'm trying to prove that, you know, we all share one single core, that uh, the linguists normally uh, just concentrate on the grammar and precisely it is the grammar that separates us. And then we are not different family. That's why I proposed, you know, the uh, prototype of the uh, basket starfish coming out from one single core. Every culture is just a branch of that same whole family. Okay. And again, if you I am going too fast, please go back to YouTube, type in the program name, and then I think this is the 75th episode, and I uh, slowly talk about each uh, sound. Sometimes one sound has different meanings, and but then I will help you with a lot of the pictograph from the very beginning, because I compare Sumerian pictograph with cuneiform, and then uh, also Chinese oracle bones, uh, Egyptian hieroglyph, you will uh, understand a lot more more uh, when I pull all this pictograph together. So a lot of the alphabet at the beginning also they were uh, recognizable as uh, abstract symbol. Okay, so only slowly with time, you know, we actually uh, lose touch with the ancient meaning of the alphabet itself. Then uh, we come to just look at uh, alphabet as just a symbol, a dead symbol. Okay, so I'm going to start right now. This week I'm going to uh, show you uh, uh, the commonality between all the ancient writings on the symbol of the heart and the head, okay? These two symbols, uh, the agent of thinking and thought. It seems that there was a long argument uh, between uh, these ancient people, whether the uh, thought process happens in the heart or it happens in the head. So you will see that it repeats itself again and again across different cultures. So this cannot be just coincident, okay? So, uh, I mean, you can be the judge yourself. I'm going to start the slides uh, for this week now. And okay, uh, this is the basket starfish. And uh, again, uh, I think, you know, uh, we are not separate uh, tree families because that only usher in human hierarchy. And then I hope that it will be changed so we can look at each other in a more common equal ground, okay? So um, last week I was talking uh, about, you know, understanding my own culture through others. And because, you know, the sound itself, it comes very, very interesting. When the Hungarian uh, sound is, Jack is means seat or stool or chair. The Chinese actually, uh, I can chase it back to very ancient writing, and the sound still carry on in Cantonese like zig zag zag like that. And then it all it actually means a mat. Of course, in ancient time before we elevate ourselves, we sit we sat on the mat, right? So as time went by, the Chinese also uh, changed. You know, it also means as your seat in a banquet in a in a feast. Okay, so um so I was wondering how on earth that this same sound, the chair jack, and also the jack, which means a mat, you know, coincide with each other until the moment I lived in the Middle East when every single day I actually eat um, uh, with uh, on a mat okay so but uh, this is to show you that this all starts from a single piece of grass this is how the Chinese writing you know I was based on because the grass actually weaved into all this mat and then um, uh, there are two different writings in Chinese and when I look up this writing uh, we use now, it actually go back to a writing like this. And when I saw this writing, I finally understand how, you know, it comes to be. Because in a feast, you know, all you need is just a mat, everybody sits around it, and then a cover over it. And this is how, you know, the uh, evolution of the meaning comes to be. The sound actually stays, you know, uh, as ancient time. It's strangely, Hungarian and Cantonese sound still, you know, maintain the sound. And then um, also, you know, when you look at this uh, carefully, you will see that this is how the Chinese oracle bone express their, uh, the weaving of a mat. And then the Sumerian also have a very similar sign, but for them, it means to sift the window. Of course, you know, if you imagine this mat itself, it's just you weave it a little bit uh, with a bigger hole, then you can actually use it to sift all the grains, you know. So basically uh, in the ancient time, if you lived in a 
context, you can understand it very easily. So um, I, because of that, I, I, I go on to search and based on that word, why is it? It means a banquet seat. Then um, I also uh, have to show you this picture uh, in different location because I wanted to show you how basic we need, uh, what basic things we need to live uh, in a in the desert, you know, when I lived with the Bedouin, they showed me this place, you know, when I went there, there was nothing. The ground was so hot. The only thing that you can uh, depend on is just a mat on the floor and that poor little tree that with all the um, cloth that they have in order to give me a shade. So you will see that, you know, this is also the picture I used to show you why the uh, Stone Age, you know, has to have a soft power behind it. Because without this little mat, you know, um, they, the men can never sit down on the on the hot ground, you know, to chip their stone tool. So, and this also explained to me, you know, in the Bible, you know, the book of Job, and in Hebrew, you will pronounce it as Job, okay? And then the book of Job, you know, why they he was describing his uh, difficult situation when this little worm ate up the tree. So if you are put in a situation like this, you will understand how important a cover and a mat is in our life, okay? So... Because of that, I also travel around and I gradually know that, you know, whenever I see all these colorful clothes, you know, borrowed from neighbors and relatives, and if they put up all this, that means they are providing a shade. Normally, it's a sign of a big feast, a wedding going on. So, um, it's interestingly, it explained to me a big question that I always had. In the 90s, I actually studied, you know, in Spain, in art, and then, um, I actually did uh, gilding. When I paint a lot of this ancient thing, because of that, I, I look at a lot of orthodox icons, you know, the church icons. Although I don't paint this icon exactly, but I always ask the question, why is there always a piece of cloth on top of something whenever, you know, um, in certain situation? Then I gradually sum up that I only see this piece of cloth in, uh, in happy occasions. Of course, in the icon you see here, it is the Pentecost when all the um, apostles receiving the tongue of fire in order to go around and, and spread, you know, the gospel. So this is a happy occasion. And also in, of course, the nativity of um, um, the Virgin Mary, you will see there is this piece of cloth. And then again, the nativity, you see this piece of cloth. And I asked many, many people who did icon, and I actually asked the Greek, you know, who copied the picture again and again from century to century. And then still, you know, no one could give me, gave, could give me a very good answer. And until I really, I went to this, you know, uh, very remote places, and then I started to notice that whenever you see pieces of cloth decorating, you know, covering the top, that means there is a happy occasion. Again, as you can see right here, and, and this is the Annunciation, whenever it's happy, you will see that this piece of cloth is just a symbol showing you that it is a happy occasion. So for centuries, you know, these uh, people who paint the icon copy the tradition, and because things change, they develop into a different lifestyle. So they no longer make sense of this. They can no longer make sense of this, of, of this piece of cloth. But then when I lived in Yemen and then when I saw this again and again, I actually linked the two together. It's interesting that Yemen actually helped me understand a Greek icon, okay? And then again, this is to prove to you. And then also because of that, I look into the ancient uh, diction, Chinese dictionary. A banquet is nothing but a seat and a cover. Look at that. We still follow the same rule until this very day. If you invite your guests, the only thing you have to worry definitely will be to give them a seat and some cover to, to cover them from the rain, from the sun, okay? So there's nothing more than just a seat and a cover. So how interesting that I actually learn, you know, uh, something unexpected through another culture and, and back to my own culture, okay? So 
Again, this is a, a slide that I want to show you to make my point. The other way of looking at a root is normally the Eurocentric view, vertical and linear, the patriarchal view. And this is what I present to you. It is the same, uh, it is the root, you know, also a root. But if you look at it at a different angle, you cut it across and then uh, from a different perspective. And also as I travel around, I'm not a scholar, but I uh, search for this uh, core, uh, language based on life and again it's oriental it's female nothing to do, do with the eurocentric uh, um, uh, male point of view okay so i propose that we actively looking outward and inward instead of up and down i think that will take away eliminate a lot of this hierarchical uh, attitude that we have in this world okay so and, and again, uh, I, I cut out, you know, something that I saw in the internet, how they uh, used to explain this Proto-Indo-European language. Look at this, you know, this is a very one-way view, you know, this, they, that they want to explain how big this Germanic and English family is. And look at the Sanskrit and Persian and Hindi all jammed together in this little space. But if you count the people, you know, they are, they, they, they are actually much more speaker than that too and then how about all the other languages so as as i said you know only by looking around you know and and outwardly and in a cross-section way that you can actually understand the picture instead of looking uh with a eurocentric view and then all these different places you know different mm, languages and the way that i looked at it is that because grammar I believe that grammar separates us into different cultures. Normally, if I go to a place, you know, I, I don't have to learn the grammar. After a while, you just copy how the people speak it, you know, it, you, it, it just falls into its place. The most important thing is that I keep hearing the same sound regarding very similar topics. So I that's why I believe that we still follow the same core sound. And, the, and also, when I started that, you know, I also found that a lot of symbol are also are uh, very, very identical. Uh, now let me show you the symbol of the heart and the head in different uh, languages, okay? Different writing systems. And first of all, normally we will uh, show the center like this. Sometimes we show it as a hub, a city, but after all, it's always the, the center of something, okay? So, uh, but uh, it's proof to you that it is not something out of the blue. It is nothing more than a human being has been using this, you know, for many, thousands of years. Now, now let's look at Sumerian. This carry a sin or shin sound. For them, it is the heart. And it seems to them that uh, they believe that it is the agent of thought. Okay. I highlight this TH right there because later on you will see the TH actually happen in the Greek world. Okay. But then uh, the sound is also uh, come in a different uh, combination. You will see slowly. But then this is Chinese. For us, this is the head, you know, the, sh the showing an ancestor. And then this is also a head and somehow it also maintain an S sound. But I will also show you this. For Chinese, this has the sound in Cantonese as C or in Mandarin as Xi, okay? And then for us, this is real thinking. Uh, for us, this is the part of the head and this is the part of the, the, the heart, okay? Obviously, uh, the Chinese actually combine the heart and the, uh, the head and the heart to show you the, the, the process of thinking. And the uh, present writing is like this. And then the process product of the thinking is very interesting. The product of thinking comes to the poetry, to the poem. Of course, if you go back, you know, even to the Greek, you know, you say Homer, and then you are still saying that the ancient actually way in poetry form, okay? In poetry, in Chinese, we still maintain, even though the right now, ignore this writing, okay? Just concentrate on how we present the, the thought process with the heart uh, with the head and the heart okay and then it uh, maintains the C and the she sound and then the she in uh, Hebrew is really poetry and then in Arabic is also she okay so it seems that the Chinese the Hebrew and the uh, Arabic all share exactly the same sound meaning exactly the same thing but in uh, Greek and PC they will 
put another sound in front, you know, ignore all this very complicated spelling. You just hear a P sound in the beginning, P C, okay? The P is actually something coming out of the mouth and then they still maintain this C sound, okay? And then let's carry on with all the symbol. And um, in linear B, which they believe is a proto-Greek, the people who lived in the area of Greece before the Greek actually arrived. This is a car symbol and sometimes it looks like this uh, even though uh, it's a cross in different uh, way okay so it's a car symbol but I can explain it to you because later on it's always used you know uh, if you want to express the Greek word kafelis. Kafelis actually means the head that's how it come to now you 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 uh, because of the writing confusion it become the sephar when you try to say the head okay so you will see that how confusing it is but the Greek actually maintained this kersan and the kafeli is the head and the cardia is the heart okay you will see that still the heart and the head always maintain a very similar symbol at the very beginning of course the cardiac you still mean uh, recognize then I was curious and then I look into Latin the Latin word one of the Latin word po for poetry is actually Carmen. Look at this. Because the call in Latin actually means the heart. Okay? So the brain for the Latin is actually men's. So it seems that for poetry, the Latin is also the combination of the heart and the brain, which is the head. Okay? So again, all this repetition of the heart and the head, the heart and the head is all always how the ancient understand how where their poetry came from. You have to use the, your brain, but you, you when you write, things has to come from your heart. Okay? So again, now you see, you're looking at actually ancient Greek. Ancient Greek started with this, but later on it developed into the th theta sound, okay? And then uh, ancient Greek de developed in different stages. At the time it become like this, and finally it become this theta that you know. But I can give you example of the word. Thutmos is actually means the heart. Of course, the heart, it actually means passion. That's why later on the thermal also comes from this because it's the heat from the heart. Your desire, which is the warmth of, from your heart, okay? And again, also when you... Uh, symbols become like this. You can actually read it into different things because the, uh, the at this stage definitely you can also use this, you know, either means the heart, um, which means the center. It actually means another Greek word, tele. Tele actually means the breast. You look at it. Can't you see also the breast? So the more abstract uh, uh, symbol is the more confusing it is in a way but the more um, uh, in, in incorporating it is because you can actually involve different meaning in the same thing actually you can look at this you can understand it as a well the, the spring you can understand as the heart you can understand the head you can also understand it as the breast right and you can also understand it as the sun so uh, the more abstract it is the more incorporating in different meaning it is okay but let me go back to this other than that of course the Greek uh, become you know more um, later on it become the uh, Christian religion and that's how they, they begin to use this exact symbol to mean the God head okay the Theos so still this means the head and because of the, uh, the ambiguity it carries the Theos also somehow in Greek means to see okay so this God head also, also has the ability to see and of course it carry on become your English this word thought and thinking okay and then uh, why why it's linked because you know from the very ancient time if you combine all the west and the east you will always know that they always believe that there is a third eye the third eye is the mind somewhere in between your eyes and it's also an eye so it become a little bit complicated okay so 
and also it use it as a number later on it also uh, use as a number nine you, we all know that the number nine is always a god number okay and then now let us look at the same symbol but they become uh, ancient phoenician or ancient uh, uh, proto sinaitic they all use this as a, a t symbol look at this th and this is a t so they are actually very similar in a way they actually interchange but then the phoenician actually uh, has a link you know to ancient Hebrew because ancient Hebrew actually also used this as a as a tet you know so the, they use this later on the Hebrew adapted other kind of writing they also use the same T as a number nine used as a God number and also uh, the way I can help you to understand is this Hebrew tet you can understand it by French you can understand it as the tet you know which means the head okay so but this become very complicated I will actually use another session to un to explain it in another week okay but now let me go on the Hungarian symbol. The Hungarian used this as a F symbol and sometimes it appear like this, sometimes it appear like this, okay? And but the Hungarian has the word Fu. Fu actually means the head or you know, the father or the capital, okay? And look at this. And then the Chinese look at back this. We also have a symbol like this and then it actually has a sound of fat like this. Don't pronounce it as fat, okay? It For us in Cantonese, we pronounce it as fat. This is a long forgotten word. You only see them in plaques in ancient temple. We use it to express those ancient souls, uh, in other words, ancestors, spirits that we worship, okay? And then we also use it to represent, you know, ghost, okay? So um, in a way, it is someone in before us in, as an ancestor. And it also means the father. Father, uh, but in father in the in the human world we use this. Can you also see the cross right there? There is a cross right there. There is a cross right there. In the contemporary Chinese, we use this word "fu" to mean actually father. So you will see that the symbol shares the sound shares between Chinese Hungarian again. Okay, so. And let me go back to Sumerian. Sumerian also have this uh, cross right there. But in this case, you know, the Sumerian logist all, uh, said that it represents a P sound. Of course, the P and F also interchange. For them, it means the first and foremost. It means the father. Look at all this. Either means something, the head. You know, in a way, it means the head as a family head, not the thinking head. Okay. So, of course, this actually goes, you know, on to become the Tau sign. That's why the Tau sign is always, you know, uh, ending the alphabet cycle because it's supposed to lead to a new cycle. It always uh, function as the head of the end. Okay, and and then if you look at the T sound, if you look back in ancient Egyptian hieroglyph, it also show you a real head. Okay, and interestingly, if you speak to a Cantonese. Tau actually truly means a human head, okay? So all this very complication is a very complicated web that you have to uh, unweb, okay? So it's never, never like the Eurocentric view is a straight line because all our culture has been intertwined since very ancient time. And let me go back to this side right there. And if you look at the hieroglyph, you know, there is a, a hole right there. And then, um, and it looks like a hole, right? But they told you that it is the sun and another way of looking at it is like this and it's representing of the rare sun of course you understand very well the sun god you know they always look at it as an ancestor but compared to this and this you will see that they keep sharing them sometimes they use it in a different sense okay and of course this become you know uh, the uh, the ed etymology you know for the Hebrew ras which means the head and of course the ra means the eye so I Either you can look at it as a fountain head or you can look at it as the CNI, okay? So that you can understand uh, Hebrew through hieroglyph. So nothing is actually pure. You have to cross-reference each, uh, each culture to understand the true meaning of a word or a sound, okay? So I will 
uh, but I don't think I have time this week, you know, but I will have another slide explain this part and, you know, separately. But let me go back to, uh, to, to uh, my last few weeks, you know, how I explained to you the core sound from Life's Basic. I uh, keep explaining to you the word SARS, uh, become weaving into different uh, objects and become the sift and then become the net and then all this sa 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 sound in uh, Sumerian coincide with the sa sa si sound in Chinese these are all meaning the net and the sieve okay so of course if you come to the real life itself it, you can be uh, understand it as a sedge the original grass that weave into a sieve and which sieve and also become uh, to, to able to separate and then uh, this is the Chinese Chinese writing for the sieve, right? And then if you understand it in reality, and then you will be uh, easy for you to understand why sometimes a uh, visual symbol actually cause boundary. For us, this sieve also goes on to give us the meaning of the head and thus explain to you why the sound is consistent with the S okay and for us this sun actually means your thinking head okay and then the C as I said the uh, she actually means to the, the thought or to ponder upon something you see the the part head and then the heart part okay and then you will see, that's why in uh, the western you uh, uh, world you can also be um, link it with Sabir and Savi and also Savan and Sage and then you will see that the clear head is always a reference to a clear sieve and this uh, reference has been on since very very ancient time as you can see from the interchanging symbol even in Chinese more than 3,500 years ago okay so and now I want to at least spin um uh, Sorry, I don't think I can finish it, but I do want to finish this to show you how uh, the heart and the head, um, let me stop it right here, okay? I wanted to show you how the heart and the head is so important in our action because only when we have the desire to ask a question that actually uh, triggers the core of the movement that activate our food to, for the search that you can actually see it through all this uh, pictograph and that's why I keep wanting to show you the pictograph and uh, unfortunately every week it's so short that I don't have the full time to show you I hope you can go back to YouTube type in the program name and and if you can give me some opinion and give me some suggestions so I can uh, explain it better to you okay